Hi folks, Mr. Ackerman here. Thanks for watching. This is the supplementary video for Unit 4, Lesson 1 and 2, where we're going to be talking about the concept of work and the work energy theorem. So by now, you've hopefully watched the two videos that I created for, um, for the background knowledge that you need. And now I'm just going to use this video to go through the lecture notes. So let's quickly jump into G class here. You're going to see that there are actually two videos work done by a constant force and the work energy theorem. I know they're a little long, so watch them at one and a half speed if you can uh, tolerate it, and that'll get you through quicker. And then for the lecture notes here, let's see what we're going to be doing if we were in class together. So moving in here, you're going to see that we're starting with a review of grade 11 physics, where you learned about the concept of work, the idea that if a force is applied on an object, and at least part of that force is in the direction of the displacement of the object, then we have a transfer of energy, and that's what we call work. Uh, when we do work on an object, any number of things can happen. It could speed up, it could slow down, and sometimes it moves at a constant velocity. And if you think about Newton's laws, you can probably figure out the situations in which that would happen. But the concept of work gives us another way of calculating what's going to happen to an object and you'll see that in some situations it's a lot easier than using forces and kinematics. More on that when we get later on into the, the unit. Okay, But for now you're going to see the first slide here for the lecture notes just has a few scenarios of positive work, negative work, and no work done. So review those and read the caption that I've put underneath them and you'll start to uh, remember when those situations apply. Next up we're going to, you'll see in the video that we derive the work energy theorem which says that the total amount of work done on an object equals its change in kinetic energy. Now it's important to remember it does not say that the work done equals kinetic energy. A lot of students make this mistake they'll write something on a test like work equals kinetic energy. And that is not at all what this says. You gotta be careful. You gotta read this the way a lawyer would read a contract and say, what are the little details? Total work. That means you have to draw a free body diagram of the object and identify all the forces so that you can do this calculation. Because that shows you the work done by each force. And then again, the work energy theorem does not say EK, it says delta EK, which means a change. That means EK final minus EK initial. So unless an object starts from rest, you're going to have to calculate the initial kinetic energy, and that's going to change what's on the right side of the equation. So this practice problem is in your textbook, so I recommend you give it a try. I think I also do it in the video, so you can follow along and check your solutions to make sure that you're getting the correct answer so that you know you're using the work energy theorem correctly. Moving on, this problem here is not in the videos that I did. It's a little more recent than that, but you're going to see it is in the textbook so you can at least check your solutions. The interesting thing here, if you look at the graph, you'll see there's a force being exerted on an object and it's causing a displacement, but the force is not constant. So if we were to calculate the work using this formula, then you might wonder, well, what am I going to use for F? Because I see the force begins at zero, and it climbs gradually until it reaches a maximum of 10 newtons. So what do I use here? If you're guessing, well, I could use the average force, then you're right. You could actually use the average. And here the average is easy to calculate because the force goes from 0 to 10 along a straight line, so the average is 5. But what if you saw a graph that looked something like this? What if there was a curve, for example? Sometimes with a curved line, the average is not the middle value, and it's harder to calculate, especially if you have something like this. Suppose the curve looked more like this stayed really flat for a long time and then shot up suddenly. Now the average, even though you start at 0 and end up at 10, the average might not be 5. You know, 5 is kind of in the middle here, but we don't get to 5 newtons of force for a really long time here. So in that case, you can't necessarily know 
what the average force is, and an easier way to find the work done is to use an idea that we've been using in the past with other graphs, and that's to calculate the area beneath the graph. So if you see that this is a triangle shape in here, and then we have a rectangle over here, then you can actually calculate the area done, which will be the work. After all, the area here is the rise, or the height rather, might be a better way to explain it, and the width. And when you multiply height by width, then you, you get area. Well, the height is in newtons, and the width is in meters. So when you multiply those two, you're going to get newtons times meters. A newton meter is a joule, and that is the units of energy, or work. So try this question here, which is in the book. Use the graphing idea, the area beneath the graph is work done. But I also added an extra question here, part D. That's not in your textbook. I added it. It asks, what would be the final speed of this moving object if instead of starting from rest, which the book says, what if you started at, th uh, sorry, at five meters per second? So now the whole idea that work equals delta EK, which is, sorry, work total equals delta EK, EK final minus EK initial, you're gonna see this is not zero, in part D, so make sure you pay attention to that in order to get the right answer. All right. Moving along, now this is something that I like to do when we're in class. I'm just going to move my self over here. Uh, the work energy theorem is a concept that I've now introduced to you, and I guess I'm asking you to believe that it's true, but as good scientists, you don't take anyone's word as truth unless you get to see the evidence for yourself. So what we normally do in class is I ask my students to design a, an experiment in which they could test whether the work energy theorem is valid. So how would we do that? I guess we could first start off by reminding ourselves that the work energy theorem says the total work equals the change in kinetic energy of an object. So EK final minus EK initial. And if you identify all of the, ty the types of force that are acting on it, you can calculate the F cos theta delta D for all forces. And if you can figure out what the final speed is, and calculate kinetic energy, and then subtract the initial kinetic energy from the initial speed, I guess you could ask yourself, does the left-hand side equal the right-hand side in this formula? And I'm going to ask you to imagine that you're in the classroom, in the lab, and you've got all the equipment that you're used to having. What could you use to get an object moving in a way that we know what forces are acting on it, and we know how far it went, and we know the angle between the forces and the displacement? And then we can also measure the mass and the final speed and the initial speed and ask ourselves this question here. So I want you to think about that and be prepared to present uh, a proposal for a sort of lab investigation that we might be able to do if we were together in the classroom. To finish off, here are a few fun little examples where zero work is being done. We just finished talking about uniform circular motion and satellite orbits, so I thought this was a good example. Believe it or not, when a satellite is in orbit and orbiting in a circle, no work is done. And you might think, why? Gravity is exerting an effort, isn't it? Isn't, doesn't that count as work? Isn't gravity making the satellite go in a circular orbit? Well, the answer is no, and I want you to think about why. And then you might still be a little confused after you see why that's the case. So maybe I can help alleviate some of your confusion by asking you uh, another question. When the satellite was launched, was work done on it? In other words, do you have to do some effort to get a satellite in orbit, or is the answer just always zero? And that's where we're going to wrap up. So thanks for watching. I'm looking forward to hearing from you with any questions that you might have. And um, once we get through this part of the unit, you're going to see we're going to quickly start to look at some new examples of forces, especially 
Hooke's law, or the spring force as it's sometimes called, and elastic potential energy. So that's where we're heading. Thanks for watching and have a great day. Bye for now.